This is Bible Academy. Today we're going to study Psalm 49. Now before we get started, as always, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins and are allowing the Spirit of God who indwells us to control us. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity and privilege and all the things you provided so we can study your word. We ask that our hearts and minds be open and ready to receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 49 is a wisdom psalm. Now, if you studied Proverbs with me, you know what wisdom is. Basically, wisdom psalms teach on how to live according to the Torah, that is the law, under the Old Covenant. They give practical instruction on how to live a good and productive life. It recognizes that God has an order to this world and that wisdom from God is the best guide in the world. In other words, if you follow wisdom, you will get the most out of God's ordered world. One of the common themes of the wisdom psalms is a presentation of two contrasting lifestyles. And what we have in Psalm 49 is the way of the rich and those ways of the faithful believer. And you will see how they come into conflict. In particular, the rich dominant over the faithful believer who often is not the rich. And we have to contend with the proclivities of the wealthy. On the other hand, for the faithful believer, there is reward in the end. Let's look at our outline. I'm keeping it simple. There's the call to listen, verses 1 through 4. Then the question is posed, verses 5 through 6. C is the folly of the rich, 7 through 13. And then we close with D, answer to the question, 14 through 20. The message is this. The wise psalmist teaches that the rich and powerful, though they think highly of themselves and are proved by many in the world, their end is nothing more than like a dead animal in the grave, and that the faithful believer who has suffered through the abuse of the rich has great blessing for all eternity. Psalm 49, the superscription, for the director of music of the sons of Korah, a psalm. We've looked at all of these several times. The sons of Korah was a specially assigned group of Levites to the music ministry of the temple. Let's begin. A call to listen, verses 1 through 4, verse 1. Hear this, all peoples. Give ear all inhabitants of the world. This is addressed to all people. Here are some teachings that the entire human race could learn from. So this is a universal truth for all. Verse 2. The call for all to listen continues. Even the sons of men, even the, excuse me, even the sons of mankind, even the sons of man, rich and poor together. The two lines are similar ones. The first line, even the sons of mankind, even the sons of men, similar phrases just simply emphasize that everyone should hear, all humanity, rich and poor together. 
So everyone is invited to hear what the psalmist has to say, every status of person, high and low, rich and poor, that is, people with money and wealth and those with little or none. In verses 3 and 4, the psalmist draws the people's attention. He'll use four key words to show them that what he is saying here could be called many things, and they need to listen. My mouth should speak wisdom. The meditation of my heart shall be understanding. Two of our key words, wisdom and understanding. Let's talk about that. So he's going to speak some wisdom, some kakamoth, practical teaching. That's some practical teaching for people to use in this world. He goes on to say, the meditation of my heart shall be understanding. Now, meditation is just like you think about it. It's, it's uh, contemplating something said or something heard. Here it is that as he thinks about this, now he's going to say something. It, sa it shall be understanding. Now, understanding, basically, the word is tabuna. That's the best translation, really, understanding. He's going to tell you what he knows of it. So this gives you some discernment, some in-depth knowledge of this subject. He's going to pass it on to you, to us. What should I be our attitude? I will incline my ear to a proverb. I will expound my riddle on the leer. Now here's what he's saying. He hears this apparently from someone else. That seems to be the idea here when I will incline my ear to a proverb. Of course, he'd know it from God as revealed to him. And it becomes revelation for us to read. And now he's going to expound it, my riddle on the leer. First of all, let's talk about the, the third key term, proverb. We've had wisdom, understanding, and now proverb. The fourth term is the next line, riddle. So I identified the four terms. Let's talk about proverb for a moment. Again, if you study proverbs with me, you're familiar with it. The proverb um, in Hebrew is mashel. Mashel. means word of wisdom. Or mashel would actually be the better pronunciation, mashel. This is what he learned, and now he's going to pass it on. He goes on to say, I will expound my riddle on the leer. To expound, the word is pathak. That means I'm going to open it up. In other words, he's going to open it up to understanding. What he's going to, up, going to open up is, is a riddle. Kada, it means a difficult saying, an obscure saying, an enigma. So he's going to open up the understanding of a difficult or obscure saying. He's going to reveal it, you might say, in teaching what it means. So we take these four words, wisdom, understanding, proverb, and riddle say that this is a difficult saying to understand but it is good practical knowledge that deepens one's insight into life and is worthy learning well and then passing it on so this is a difficult saying to understand but it's good practical knowledge that deepens one's insight into life and is worthy learning well and passing on. And he's going to explain it while accompanied by a lyre. A lyre is a small handheld harp. You've seen them probably in perhaps in uh, ancient drawings or pictures of what it would have been like. It's basically a little U-shaped Lear. It's like a U and has a crossbar and the, and the uh, 
wires are leading down to the bottom of the U. So now that he has his audience's attention, he has piqued their interest, he's going to raise a question. The question is in verses 5 and 6. We'll read those together. Why should I fear in days of evil? And the iniquity of those who cheat me surrounds me. Those who trust in their wealth and boast in their great riches. Talk about the days of evil. Basically, this is times of trouble, difficult times. Why should I fear in times of trouble or difficult times? When the iniquity, the word for iniquity, avon, basically it means guilt or punishment. Here it's whatever these people do to hurt him. Which includes, look at the second line again here, people cheating him, who surround him and cheat him. Interesting word for cheat, I can show it to you. I weigh the time and have to do all these, but akeb, it means heel of footprint. The derived meaning of cheat apparently comes from someone who follows another hot on his heels, we might say. He's planning some devious action towards him to set up a trap to take advantage. And these are people, those who trust in their wealth and boast in their great riches, so these last two lines describe the character, the typical behavior of these people who trust in their wealth. They are going to cheat, often faithful believers. Not just faithful believers, but that's who we're most concerned with here. They cheat everybody they can get away with, actually. But here we're going to contrast his lifestyle with what a believer has coming. So this question, covering two verses, is really a rhetorical question to make a statement, to make a point to the audience. The point is there is no reason to fear the days of evil. No fear to, of those who trust in their wealth, boast in their riches, who often will cheat those at a disadvantage. People often fear in days of trouble, financial ruin, debt coming due, payments not made. They can't seem to make ends meet. People who have money are often feared because they have the power also whether it be creditors or the landlord, perhaps it's an insurance company, whoever has money and a power ready to come down on those who do not. They are viewed here as threatening and cheating, dishonest and abusive. Now you've probably heard me talk about the Cosmos Diabolicus and how corruption penetrates everything, basically every business, every institution, whether it be law and order, the courts, uh, the military, the education, the social systems, the ed entertainment, they're all corrupted. And here we see it in particular in the area of finances and people have money. Now listen, this is an important lesson here I think that many would not get normally. If you fear those people because they have the money and power, then you're thinking like they do. Their intimidation towards you has worked. And the first thing you need to do is quit thinking like the rich and the powerful do. That that's where the power really lies. That's where the threat really is. You don't need to think like that. As a Christian, you should have a much different viewpoint. Now we're going to develop that as we go through here. So the psalmist is going to begin to destroy this 
line of reasoning that the rich and powerful have and those who are intimidated by their wealth and power, the psalmist is going to begin to destroy that line of thinking, why it is flawed. For those who, thrill threat, who feel threatened by the rich and the powerful, whether it be the government or some business or some company or someone who threatens you, listen to the destruction of their viewpoint. We begin to look at it through this next category, the folly of the rich, verses 7 through 14. It begins by telling us, verse 7, with what the rich cannot do with his money. Now listen carefully. Surely he cannot redeem a brother or give God a ransom price for him. All right, now this sentence will continue actually in verse 9 with a parenthesis in verse 8. But let's work through this and make sure we understand it, this verse 7. Surely it means with certainty, certainly, this cannot be done. The wealthy man can neither redeem or buy any ransom price for a brother. In what sense are we talking about? In the sense of keeping him alive. He can't extend his life for a moment. Seriously. You say, well, with good medical care, he can live 10 years longer. Maybe so. But how does that compare to eternity? Hardly does. So the idea is that he's not able to purchase with all his money, with all his power and wealth, he cannot save even his own brother. And then we get a parenthesis that helps us explain why he can't. That's verse 8. I even put it in parenthesis. For the redemption price of their life is too costly, and he ceases forever. It's not a very smooth the way we had to put this in English, but the idea is it's too costly in the sense that it cannot be done. Man cannot buy life. All the money in the world cannot purchase continuous life. Then when the person dies, this very last short phrase, he's dead forever. So everything a rich and powerful person tries to do to save his brother from death, it can't be done. And then when that brother dies, he's gone forever. So he slips out of his hands, he can't keep him, can't hold on to him, and he's gone forever. So that explains the sense of which he cannot redeem a brother or, ran, or pay a ransom price to God for him. What one must realize is that he's dealing with eternal matters here. He's not talking about some temporal sickness or even temporal time on earth. And when it comes to eternal matters, money, power, wealth is useless. Now, Let's go back to our verse 7 to see our sentence. We'll skip the paragraph this time. Surely he cannot redeem a brother or give God a ransom price for him that he should live on forever and never see the pit. So let's just put both of these verses together. The pit, the shakath, as it is in the Hebrew. It's a place of decay, a place of destruction. It comes from a verb that means go to ruin or corrupt. So here we are again, seeing that the rich and the powerful, the wealthy, cannot do anything to extend the life of another person. You can't buy eternal life. You can't buy, well, they used to call it eternal youth. No one avoids seeing the pit, that is, the grave. Death is inevitable. 
The idea is that a very wealthy man, even with all his money, cannot redeem or pay a ransom price for a brother to prevent him from dying. God is the one who controls life and death. So a rich man cannot purchase from God even one extra minute of life for anyone. They think they're extending his life those extra ten years with all that extra medical treatment. Not really. That was exactly how long God wanted that person to live that extra 10 years and then he's gone you know the rich and powerful are used to buying their comforts and then exercising their control over others but at death death puts everyone at the same level that servant who waited on him for 40 years perhaps hand and foot and that rich person all come down to the same level at death the extremely rich and the poor beggar both go to the grave. Whatever comforts one has in this life all disappears at death. And just like the poor beggar, his body will go to the pit and to decay. So put it short, to put it short, so money is worthless in avoiding inevitable death. The subcategory of the rich are those who think they're wise. Verse 10. For he sees that even the wise die. The fool and the senseless alike must perish and leave their wealth to others. We come to conclusion here with the word for. He, that's the rich man, or just anyone, anyone can see this. He sees that even the wise, that is, now listen, those who know the way of the world, those who know these proverbs, who know how to live life in this world according to God's rules, they don't avoid death either even including the psalmist. Everyone dies. There's no avoiding of it. However, the wise know something, that is, the godly wise know something the fools do not. But they all end up in the same death, that is, they all die. The fool here rejects God, his existence, ignores him, they don't have a true knowledge of how the world works. The senseless, well, he doesn't even begin sensing God when he actually becomes aware of him. He doesn't care. He wipes it out. He hardens the truth. He gets no sense of purpose in life. So his life is without any purpose at all. The wise, the fool, the senseless, when they die, Put it this way, when all of us die, whatever wealth we have, we leave to others. So what does this tell us? The fool who believes there is no God or the senseless, the one who never chooses to examine the evidence and remains insensitive to God, his creation, his existence, they leave their wealth to someone else, as does the wise. Whatever anyone has accumulated, it likewise is perishes by going to someone else. You can't take it with you, as they say. However, in their mind, some think that their wealth or name will continue. Verse 11. Let's look at that line of thinking. Their inner thought is that the houses, their houses are forever. And their dwelling places, and their dwelling places to all generations. They have called their lands after their own names. Now this is something that's not difficult to understand. Sometimes it just seems unusual. You'd see it in the ancient writings. Let's begin with the first phrase, their inner thought. Their inner feelings. The word is karev. 
Karev. <coughs> Some translations think these last two letters in this particular word, Karev, is wrongly transposed. In other words, they think they should be in reverse order. So you have the left two large letters should be reversed. The scribe reversed them, which would give it a different meaning. The meaning would be graves. So they want to transfer, translate it, their graves are their homes forever. Uh, some of your modern translations do that. Uh, New American Standard, the King James, New King James stays with the translation that I have. Instead of their graves, I have it as their inner thoughts. So their inner thoughts is that their houses are forever and their dwelling places to all generations. That seems to be the most consistent uh, in this particular context. In other words, they think that because when they die that they had this big mansion, if they have a mansion, or just a nice house, let's say, their family's going to get it and then that family's going to get it, but no, they die too. And then, and, and not only do they die too, the grandchildren and great-grandchildren, they all die. Eventually the house is torn down. It's eventually gone. But one doesn't think that far ahead. He just thinks, well, I'm going to leave this with my kids. Somehow they think their houses live on, <laughs> but they don't. Or their family's going to continue to live there. Often families just sell the houses. They have their own houses by then. And that's what happens when I've seen it so many times. People don't come back to their parents' house and live there. Some do exceptions of course depending on the circumstances but the person who dies often thinks well I'm going to pass this house on I'll leave me something of them to them no no you live a temp you leave a temporary house to their temporary life and both will be gone before long and then they talk about their land and how they're going to name some land or something after them and that'll continue the their life in some sense. You see this particularly in <clears throat> movie stars. They make a movie and think somehow they live on in that movie. Now that's a plastic image on a piece of film of them. That's not them at all, but we know what they're talking about. The life ends when it ends. There's no perpetuation of it on earth. <clears throat> they name a building after themselves a property, a street, a hospital wing. Somehow it adds to their continuance on earth. It doesn't. Even the memory passes. Um, think of all the... Well, let's look at it this way. Think of all the names you've heard in history that go back for hundreds and thousands of years. The only reason we remember them is because somebody wrote them down, but they're still not alive. Um, they've been dead for hundreds of thousands of years. The only permanent home is the grave, and that's death. So the psalmist continues to demolish the thinking of the rich and the powerful. And again, if somehow you have bought into some of their thinking, many do. They strive to be like the rich and the powerful, to have what they have, to get their fame, their splendor. Verse 12. But splint, but man in his splendor will not remain. He is like the beast to perish. This gets right down to the nitty-gritty, you might say. Splendor, the word splendor, but man in his splendor. The word yakar has to do with his honor or glory. Whatever honor or glory he required on this earth, it will not remain. The idea of remain, interesting word they use here, or that the psalmist used, the word is lin, it means to lodge, to spend the night. Let's see if I get up here for you. <clears throat> it means to lodge or spend the night. So 
it's not gonna, it's not going to spend the night either. It's not going to lodge either very long. That's the idea. But man has spent it will not remain. It's just an overnight stay anyway, and it'll be over with. It's temporal. His temporal living place will be gone just as he is gone. And then the last line, <clears throat> he is like the beast to perish. Word for beast here is also the word for cattle. The man who is honored in splendor ends up no different than the cow that lived in the field or in the barn. And then verse 13 ends the description of this flawed thinking. This is the way of those who are foolish and of those after them who approve their deeds, Selah. Let's look at a line of time here. This is the way, the path they've chosen. Of those who are foolish, that's those who ignore God and live for the wealth. And of those after them who approve their words, the word for approve, saw means they accept or pleased with their words. In other words, they bought in the philosophy of the rich. Let's look at that word for a moment just to Ratsa means to accept. They're pleased with. They hear what the rich and powerful say and they approve of it. Oh yeah, that's right. That's right. They look at their wealth. They look at their comfort and say, that's the way to live. That's the, way to, that's the only way to live. So that's what they strive for. That's what they approve of. That's who they look up to. They approve of their words. That's literally the word is mouth metaphorical for what they say. Now, let's understand. It's not having wealth that is seen as foolish, but the attitude that often comes with it. Rich, wealthy, powerful people often develop a self-sufficiency They've learned to control people with their money, their power. And they believe that they've built their own life for themselves, by themselves, and they don't need God. At the same time, they become unaccountable since they don't also believe there's a judgment in the future. No God, no judgment. That's logical if there was no God. So they do whatever they get away with, and that includes how they treat people. Here we see that others approve of that thinking and buy into that. They will often cater to the wealthy and powerful to get on their good side to perhaps share some of their wealth and power. But they buy into that philosophy and their ways and fall into the same traps though perhaps not as successful in gaining wealth and power. Now let's just talk about this before we move on to answer the question because I want to expand on this thinking that people have. We think because we don't have money that, well, it depends on one's Christian attitude on this. But many think that the reason I don't have money is because God hasn't blessed me. Then I would ask you, well, whoever said to have money means you're blessed? That would make the rich really blessed, wouldn't it? Yeah, but not by God. They're blessed by the world. I, will, I, I want God to bless me with, with money from his money trees. Why? 
so you can be like the rich and powerful. You can have the big houses, you can have the power, you can have the power, you can have the nice cars. Now don't misunderstand, everyone likes something nice, everyone likes something comfortable. But that's often the way of those who do not need God. That's often the way of so many who think that if they just had that, they'd be better off. Now as a Christian, and you don't have it, you probably wouldn't be. Money, power, wealth are big distractions, huge distractions. People become occupied with making money, then they continue to be occupied to keep their money and not to lose it. That's the way of the world. Whereas a believer, it's not about money, it's not about power, it's not about acquiring things or position, it's about drawing close to God. And you might say, yeah, but they just take advantage of us and they, and they raise their interest rates ridiculously high and they control all the billing systems and the banking systems and this and that and they just continue to abuse the believer. And I would agree with you. That's true. They do. But remember, you have God. They don't. You have eternal life, and they don't. All they got is the world. What would you expect from them? That's all they live for. And then when their time is up on earth, it's to the grave for them. We're, when we're done suffering through their abuse, which is what this psalm is partly about, we have eternal blessing with our Lord Jesus. What I'm trying to say is, why do we want to strive to be like those who give us the most difficult time? Do you ever think about that? Why do we admire a movie star who is so corrupt in their thinking, and now you see it in their movies that they allow them to do it, why do we admire them? Because they act like someone else. You know what we call that in Christianity? Hypocrisy. <laughs> I think we sometimes get so caught up in the emotionalism of it, and perhaps the glamour, that we forget what's behind all of that. Basically, it's nothing. The richest, most famous, the most admired people die and go to the grave. And most are without God. Very few exceptions. And when I say without God, they don't know Jesus Christ. And they're burning in eternity. And they will burn eternity for eternity in the lake of fire. The world bombards us every day with these images of what's good, but it's what's good in the eyes of the world, not what's good in the eyes of God. I think the thing that most struck me as I studied through these verses up to this point is that it's very easy to fall into the same trap that the rich and powerful do. They think that's their goal in life and they attain it. And we see them and see their comforts and see their wealth and say, boy, that'd be nice to have all that. Really? You say, well, I could handle it well. How do you know that? If someone gave you $50 million right now, you think you'd be sitting down to hear Bible studies? I'm not so sure. I can see people writing their list right now of all the stuff they'd buy and all the stuff they would do. 
and the Lord God's ways goes right out the window. You know, this may sound strange, but there's real advantages to not having money. There really is. It puts you in a position where you constantly have to depend upon the Lord for your daily bread. And isn't that the model prayer that Jesus gave? Give us this day our daily bread. Let me ask you a simple question. Was Jesus rich? Did he teach people to go be rich? Did he speak that or pass it on to his disciples to go be rich? To be powerful? Not at all. It was all about knowing the Father. And then it became knowing the Father through him. Well, let's see how this psalm answers the question that we had at the beginning about why fear those days of trouble? Why fear those rich? Section D, 14 through 20. Answer to the question, verse 14. As sheep they are appointed for Sheol, death shall shepherd them, and the upright shall rule over them in the morning, and the form shall be for Sheol to consume away from his lofty mansion. As sheep they are appointed for Sheol, the place of death, that is, the rich and powerful, that is, those who buy into that philosophy, who hear their words, they're all going to Sheol. They're all going to death. Notice this interesting line. Uh, well, a couple of words here. Let me look at one of these words with you. Sheath is the word. As sheep, they're appointed for Sheol. They're appointed to go there. That's the idea. Basically, the word means to be set or put. They're appointed to go there. That's what happens. Their rejection of God, rejection of Christ, as we would put it today. I like this line. It's interesting. Death shall shepherd them. Death is their shepherd. That's the word, shepherd. Like death is their shepherd, they are being led like sheep to Sheol. And then we come back with this interesting line right in the middle here. And the upright... And the upright shall rule over them in the morning. The upright or the righteous. The morning used here is for, well, it's a metaphor for a new day. The idea is that that new day brings God's justice. God's justice is executed. The upright will, they're the ones that's going to be on top then. The sense is here that they will rule over, they will, and the upright shall rule over them, that is, the corrupt in the morning. They're the ones that's going to be the high, in the high status then. They will rule over the corrupt wealthy who have depended on their wealth, who have gone on to Sheol. They will be with the Lord in heaven. The others, they'll be in Sheol. Then it goes on to say, and there, that's the rich and powerful, their form, uh, that has to do with their bodily image, their body. Uh, the word is seer. I don't see this word too often. Their physical body shall be for Sheol. And it goes on to describe what's going to happen there. And death. To consume away from his lofty mansion, away from his beautiful mansion, his home. So what happens to the rich and powerful without God and the poor who have God? 
when that new day comes and God comes and he judges and he vindicates the righteous, the righteous move to the top, the unrighteous, wealthy, and powerful, they consume away in death. The faithful believer is with the Lord forever. Interesting how they bring up the very end. Away from their lofty mansion, they lose all that comfort. So this verse sums up what's happened, what happens to the people who are wealthy without God. Those who have striven to be that way and who have believed in that philosophy, they all end up in the same place. Death leads them to Sheol where their bodies, what they got so much pleasure and comfort in, will decay. Away from their beautiful mansions, whatever grand house they lived in while on earth. So when the new day comes, we might call it the day of vindication. The darkness is over, the trials of life are over. God brings in the light and it's shown that the believer is the one who has been doing what God would have him do. He will be basking in eternal life, granted him in his eternal home. The lesson there is no good reason to strive for wealth and power or be afraid of those who have gained both. The temporal wealth and power on earth mean nothing in the eternal realm. But the lesson's not over. And by the way, let's look at this lesson again. Notice how this completely refutes the false teaching of the health and wealth gospel. It is so much opposite of what the scripture teaches. When people say something like, don't you think God wants you healthy and wealthy? Well, your answer should be no. Why should he? And they would just stumble thinking, how could you say that? Because they bought into it so deeply, you see. Well, God will give you health if he wants you to have it. Just leave it at that. And you'll be wealthy too if he wants you to have it. But we've just learned about the dangers of wealth. There's much to say about the dangers of wealth. And again, it's not to say that having money is sinful. No. But there's a lot of problems that come with having money. Verse 15 begins the other side and gives us the hope of the faithful believer. But God will redeem my life from the power of Sheol, for he will receive me, Selah. Keep in mind what we just saw happens to the rich and powerful. They decay away in Sheol. The image here is that the faithful believer will be redeemed. God will redeem his life. He's the only one that can. From the power of Sheol, he will pull him out of death. It's sent hence strongly at resurrection. For he will receive me, Selah. And that word redeem is the same word for someone trying to redeem his brother from death we saw earlier. The power is actually the word hand here often used for power. Of Sheol, the word for death, basically, represents death. For he will receive me. The word actually is lakak. It means to take also. Lakak, put that way, lakak, lakak. To take and receive. Now, I have understood this as being resurrection. Some see this as deliverance from a premature death at the hands of the rich. But either way, God has 
paid the price for the believer's redemption. In light of the New Testament, we know that to be the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. Death does not keep the believer like the unbeliever. The believer's spirit goes to stay with the Lord. The body is later resurrected. Knowing this, verse 16, now that you know this believer, do not be afraid when a man becomes rich, when the glory of his house increases. increases. The wise believer is not to be afraid of the rich and the powerful or the power they've accumulated. Those with their growing estate and power, even those who heap abuse, will not be so powerful and wealthy in the end. Verse 17, we come down to the answer. For when he dies, he will carry nothing away. His glory will not go down after him. As someone said, there's no U-Haul trailer hitched onto the back of a hearse. For when he dies, he will carry nothing away. All his power, all his wealth is gone. None of this will go down after him. Uh, like the old Egyptians thought about their pharaohs that bear, bury much of their wealth with them, including their women and their prized possessions. Even food, thinking they'd need this in eternity. No, that's all false thinking. Not unlike, though, many who attach their name to buildings, thinking they're going to live on somehow. Verse 18. <clears throat> Speaking of the wealthy again. Though he blesses himself in this life and people praise you when you do well for yourself. The life, uh, word for life here is nephish. That inner self, the real you. The English is kind of awkward here, but the idea is that he thinks so highly of himself that he sees his good fortune as all his doing though he blesses himself in this life, in his life. It's kind of like the guy who walks around and says, bless me, bless me. <clears throat> He's blessing himself. And people praise you when you do well for yourself. Well, this helps him think that he's somehow blessing himself. People praise him at that. So these people's praise confirm to him what he has done well and gives him good reason to continue to bless himself. Let's continue this sentence actually. Let me read it and then I'll continue verse 19. Though he blesses himself in his life and people praise you when you do well for yourself, it, referring to the life, shall go to the generation of the fathers. They will never see the light. This is a way of saying that they're going to just go where everybody else went. Their ancestors went on to death, where they see no light. Their death is infinite darkness. They will not see the light of day forever in their status of separation from God. Verse 20 gives a summary statement and final conclusion. Man in his splendor, yet without understanding, is like beasts that perish. That really sums it up. Man in all his glory and all his honor, yet without understanding, he really doesn't know what life is about. The wealthy, powerful, accomplished receive all the accolades of the world, the glory, the honor, the prestige, the very things so many seek. But this defines him, yet without understanding. 
He really doesn't know what's going to happen when his life is over. He does not understand life's purpose and how to really enjoy life on earth. They've hardened their heart for their entire lifetime, ignoring God and his gift of eternal life, so they die like cattle. Now with all this information, the question and the answer, the psalmist only gives a partial answer in light of what the scripture has in this particular psalm. If you didn't pick up on it, basically I filled in the divine viewpoint for the believer. But that wasn't in the psalm. It's important to know what we learned in this psalm. It's important to know that partial answer. And that is that life is not about wealth and power and accumulating all the stuff that comes with it. That kind of thinking gets one uh, and keeps one on the wrong path. The other lesson was that we don't have any reason to fear the rich and the powerful. But that part of the answer teaches us what not to do. The other part of the answer is what I've filled in from the rest of the Word of God. Scripture teaches that life really only begins when one has a relationship with his Creator and then walks with him throughout his journey on earth. Knowing this, we give ourselves over to God for sacrificial service. It matters not how much or little money or power you have. It is your attitude towards serving God, and God gives us all we need to serve Him. If you're very old, by that I mean probably in your 50s and 60s, you realize how fast life has gone by you. Before you know it, you're starting to look like your parents. You're starting to feel the aches and pains. And you know life is coming. Well, you're on the downward side, let's put it that way. But you also know, as a faithful believer, that you live your life right. Folks, learn the lessons. Don't buy in to the wealth and power that is beginning to dominate much of religious Christianity today. It's a sad thing to see people fall for that. And then what money they do have, they give to those ministries that promote that. I always thought it was an interesting job of manipulation to make people think because they don't give money is the reason they don't they're not wealthy. So you've got to give it to the church or the particular that preacher's ministry so you can get wealthy. And you may get wealthy, but that's not the way of God. That's not the path that God has us on. We are to live a life of sacrificial service, and He brings wealth along fine. If not, Fine, probably better. Let's look at our translation. Psalm 49. A little trouble getting it up there. Okay, here we go. For the director of music of the sons of Korah, a psalm. Hear this, all peoples, give ear, all inhabitants of the world, even the sons of mankind, even the sons of man, rich and poor together. My mouth shall speak wisdom. The meditation of my heart shall be understanding. I will incline my ear to a proverb. I will expound my riddle on the leer. Why should I fear in days of evil when the iniquity of those who cheat me surrounds me, those who trust in their wealth and boast in their great riches? 
Surely he cannot redeem her brother or give God a ransom for him. For the ransom, for the redemption price of their life is too costly, and he ceases forever, that he should live on forever and never see the pit. For he sees that even the wise die, the fool and the senseless alike must perish and leave their wealth to others. Their inner thought is that their houses are forever and their dwelling places to all generations. They have called their lands after their own names. But man in his splendor will not remain. He is like the beast to perish. This is the way of those who are foolish and of those after them who approve their words. As sheep they are appointed for Sheol, death shall shepherd them, and the upright shall rule over them in the morning, and their form shall be for Sheol to consume away from this lofty mansion. But God will redeem my life from the power of Sheol, for he will receive me. Do not be afraid when a man becomes rich, when the glory of his house increases. For when he dies, he will carry nothing away. His glory will go down, after, will not go down after him. Though he blesses himself in his life, and people praise you when you do well for yourself, it, his life, shall go to the generation of his fathers. They will never see the light. Man in his splendor, yet without understanding, is like beasts that perish. Truly, death is the great leveler. That is our lesson. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we do thank you again for your word. We thank you for these simple truths that give us so many important answers to life. In the power of your spirit, we ask that we'll apply them properly and live as we should and trust you for everything that we need so we can serve you. Thank you for these things. In Jesus' name, amen.